Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the meeting of the uh, Planning and Highways Committee. I'll hand over to Abby for housekeeping. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, in the event of a fire alarm sounding, please take instruction from staff and stewards. The assembly point is at Tudor Square. Please can I request everyone to switch mobile devices to silent mode so as not to disturb the conduct of the meeting. The meeting today will be webcast and the recording will also be available for people to view later through the Council's website. While ever the meeting is open to the public, photography, video and sound recording of the proceedings is permitted. However, the Chair has discretion to withdraw or suspend this permission, for example, if the recording is disrupting the conduct of the meeting or is being undertaken in a manner which could capture personal information or in the event that a member of the public participating in a meeting objects to being recorded. Thank you. Thank you, Abby. Um, for information, um, we're altering the order of today's business. Um, Agenda item 9C will become before agenda item 9B. Uh, agenda item 9B is being withdrawn at the request of applicants. Um, I'll now ask members to introduce themselves, starting with Brian, please. Um, uh, Councillor Brian Holmshaw, uh, representing Broomhill and Sheriff Vale Ward, uh, Green Party Councillor. Mike. Good afternoon, Councillor Mike Chaplin. Representing Southey Ward. Hey everyone, uh, Councillor Nigat Bishop for uh, Netherlands and Cheryl Ward. Diane. Good afternoon, my name is Diane Hurst. I'm a councillor for Richmond Ward. Peter. Peter Price, uh, member for Shea Green Brightside. Tony. Barbara? Barbara Masters, councillor for Ecclesall Ward. Starting in the middle there, Cliff. Oh, uh, Roger Davidson, councillor for um, Ecclesall Ward. Clifford. Cliff. Cliff Woodcraft, councillor for Fullwood Ward. Anne. And I'm Alan Woodcock, councillor for East Ecclesfield Ward, chairing today's meeting. Thank you. Do we have any apologies from absence? Please. No. Thank you, Chair. We've had apologies today from Councillor Gary Weatherall, and his sub is Councillor Anne Murphy. And we've also had apologies from Councillor Bob McCann. Thank you. Excluding the press and public? Yeah, no? No. Do we have any declarations of interest from the members? Yeah. J just to declare that the um, application on Paper Mill Road is in my patch, but I've spoken to nobody about it, so I will, call it, I will respond. And I will do the same for the uh, tree preservation order. St Mary's Roman Catholic Church, that's in my ward, and I have no um, thoughts on it at all. Thank you. Can we go through the minutes of the previous meeting? Page nine. Nope. Eleven. Eleven. Yeah. On, page, on page ten, uh, for item four one, um, were, were the minutes amended to take account of the fact it wasn't me that had uh, expressed an interest? Uh, yeah, expressed an interest in. Uh, I think it was Southview Road. Thanks, Mike. We'll then those. 
Chair, that was the previous meeting, with, with the amendment was made at the previous meeting to that. Eleven? No. Twelve? Thirteen? And that's it, thank you. Uh, the date and time of the next site visit will go into members' diaries. So now I'd like to pass over to Vanessa, Tree Preservation Order. Just a moment, I'll find it. Um, up there to the land north of Junction Road, Woodhouse. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. I'm seeking confirmation of TPO number 454, which is a woodland order made on the 12th of May to protect a broadleaf woodland at land north of Junction Road. Um, you'll find a copy of the order and it's accompanying map in uh, Appendix A of the report. The woodland's primarily silver birch, goat, willow and oak and it forms a belt of trees which runs directly adjacent to the railway line for approximately 450 metres. Um, this site has been subject to a full planning application which has now lapsed in two pre-applications and officer reports accompanying the full application and the pre-app note the importance of the retention of this strip of woodland which has been, which hopefully will be protected by TPO 454 because it forms a green link for wildlife between the Shirtcliffe Brook and the River Rother. Um, the importance of the corridor has been assessed as part of the natural capital mapping project with advice from council ecologists stating that were the site to be developed, the corridor should be retained with a buffer zone to the railway of the minimum of 20 metres being requested. On the, 26th of April, sorry, on the 27th of April, um, the council received two phone calls stating that 200 of the silver birch had been marked with blue dots. And the concern was that they had been identified to be removed, potentially to allow for greater development of the site. Um, Planning officers, enforcement and council members were alerted to this and I was asked to go and assess the woodland um, and assess its suitability for protection with the TPO. The inspection took place on the 4th of May and a tempo assessment was carried out which is included in Appendix B and you can see images of the woodland at Appendix C. The assessment produced a clear recommendation for protection and it was therefore considered expedient in the interest of amenity to make the TPO. With regards to amenity, the woodland's clearly visible from Junction Road, Furnace Lane and Soap House Lane. The condition of the trees is predominantly good throughout, although they're quite suppressed, growing as they are in a woodland, which is normal. Um, the trees appear predominantly defect-free and of good vitality. A conservative estimate of the lifespan of the trees is given at about 20 to 40 years, which reflects the fact that the woodland is mainly comprised of birch, which is a short-lived species but the growth of new trees will mean that the actual lifespan of the wood far, far exceeds this. So the, the woodland offers good amenity to the area for many years to come. And finally, the ecological importance of the woodland has been assessed. Um, um, the woodland strip has been de deemed important for a number of species. One objection has been received from a town planning consultancy which are acting on behalf of their client, um, who I believe is in the process of obtaining ownership of the land. A copy of the objection letter can be found within the appendix. In summary, the author stated no objection to the imposition of the TPO so long as various trees were removed from it. Um, and the removal of the trees was to facilitate development, which will be the subject of a new planning application. However, of these trees identified for, for removal, several fall outside of the boundary of the TPO, so there would be no need to exclude them. A proportion do fall within the protected area, and plans supplied with the report show the proposed footprint of several homes as overlapping the edge of the proposed protected area, hence the request to remove some of the trees. However, incursion of development into the 20 metre buffer zone contravenes aforementioned advice from council ecologists, and it would also necessitate removal of trees, which it's been considered expedient in the interest of immunity to protect. So my request would be that the TPO be confirmed or modified. Thank you, Vanessa. Do we have any member questions? Member comments? 
Can we take a vote, please? Brian? Uh, I agree with the officer's recommendation. Mike? Agree the recommendation. Nigga? I uh, agree with the recommendations. Tony? Peter? Agree, Chair. Ben? Four Chair. Four Chair. Agree, Chair. Agree, Chair. Anne? Agree, Chair. Pass, thank you. Uh, the next item on the agenda is uh, Tree Preservation Order number 455, St Mary's Roman Catholic Church. Back to you, Vanessa. Thank you. Thank you. So, TPO 455 was made on the 19th of May to protect four trees at St Mary's Roman Catholic Church, which is on Pat Course Lane in Sheffield, S35. A copy of the order with its accompanying map is attached at Appendix A. The order seeks to protect four mature trees consisting of a purple beech, a lime and two sycamore, which are located within the Kirtledge of St Mary's. The purple beech stands to the front of the site and is adjacent to Mortonley Lane, and the two sycamore on the line form a linear feature to the northwest boundary of the site. The site is subject to an outline planning application regarding the demolition of buildings and the construction of two dwellings. Um, plans supplied with the outline proposal show the intended removal of the three trees to the rear of the site. Um, it actually showed four trees being marked on the plan, although there are in fact only three. The beach to the front of the site was marked for retention and the trees are not within a conservation area and so are not marked subject to any measure of protection. Given the potential loss of mature trees, a council officer responsible for commenting on the application requested that they be inspected and that their suitability for a TPA be assessed. I inspected the trees on the 5th of May and a tempo um, assessment was carried out, which you can also find within um, the appendix. The trees were scored at 14 points respectively the beach to the front of the site, while not earmarked for removal, was also inspected and considered for protection within the TPO, as it was felt that the tree would be vulnerable during the construction phase. As I mentioned, the tree scored 14 points, which gave a clear recommendation for protection, and it was therefore considered expedient in the interest of immunity to make the TPO. With regards to immunity, these are large stature visible trees. The beach stands to the front of the site and is clearly visible from Mortonley Lane, which is a busy road bisecting the high green area. The sycamore and lime are particularly visible above the roof of the church, and they've got a public vantage point from Mortonley Lane, Pat Course Lane and Bellamy Court. The size of the trees mean they can be seen from some distance, and their presence forms a green screen, which acts to soften the nature of the built environment. Um, I noted that T2 in particular has an aesthetically pleasing large open crown. They're in good condition, an estimated retention span of 20 to 40 years, so they'll offer immunity for many years to come. And finally, the site is within an area of special character and the trees are part of the distinct character of that site. And they're likely a remnant from a time when the area had a more rural feel. And no objections have been received to the making of the TPO. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. Roger. I note from the, uh, the photographs that the uh, trees are very close to the building. Will that pose any problem for any new build that is going to take place? Thank you. Um, yeah, the trees do stand close to the existing building and they're kind of in a little raised area of earth next to an area of hard standing. And then the, the new build is, uh, sorry, the existing building is directly adjacent. It is likely that some of the roots will be underneath some of the hard standing, depending on how that has been laid. And so any new proposal that comes in will probably need to take account of that and map um, the root protection areas of the tree and be placed on the site accordingly. Anyone else? No? Can we move to a vote, please? Brian? Vote for you, Brian. <coughs> Sorry, I agree with the officer's recommendation. Mike. Agreed, Chair. Leah. Yeah. Agree. Uh, my uh, one other question was similar to Roger, but that's been sent, so I agree. 
Mike, Tony? Peter? Agreed, Chair. Diane? Full Chair. Roger? Agreed, Chair. Barbara? Agreed, Chair. Clifford? Agreed, Chair. Anne? Agreed, Chair. That's passed, thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. Right, our next um, one to hear is application number 22 02651 uh, CHU 9 Paper Mill Road, Sheffield. Duke. Thank you, Chair. <laughs> Am I supposed to speak here? I'm sorry, I don't know. Oh, no, I'll I'll invite you to this bit. I'll invite you. Thank you. Sarah. Thank you. Um, this application relates to Nine Paper Mill Road. Planning permission is sought for alterations uh, from a two-storey, um, two-bed dwelling house to form two studio flats. Um, next slide, please. And I think you can scroll on a little bit. And you can. Thank you. Uh, this slide shows the red line boundary. Um, the site is located to the south of Paper Mill Road. It's an end terrace property which benefits from a uh, large garden area. Next slide, please. This is an aerial image. Uh, it shows the site in the wider context. Um, it's a predominantly residential area characterised by semi detached and terraced housing. The site lies within a housing area as defined in the adopted unitary development plan. The principle of subdivision to form two studios is acceptable in terms of policy. Um, this is an image taken from the front of the property. Um, and these are the elevations and floor plans. So there are no external changes proposed to the property. Um, the floor plans illustrate that the subdivision will take place um, so that one unit occupies each floor. Um, each unit will benefit from a separate kitchen and bathroom area and then a combined living and bedroom area. Plans illustrate that each unit will, all rooms will benefit from natural light and outlook. Um, and it's considered that um, an adequate level of amenity will be provided for residents. The garden will be shared between both properties uh, and one or street parking space will be provided to the front of the site. The officer recommendation is to grant conditional. Thank you, sir. We have no, uh, we have one speaker, which is four, which is Alina. So you can come to the desk now, please, Alina. You have five minutes, and then please return to your seat. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say that um, <clears throat> we decided to buy the property um, and, and to convert it to two flats because we had we have several emails which I've got copies of here um, from um, private housing solutions from the council saying there's a desperate need um, for for um, self-contained properties like this um, and so we we really wanted to do something that would be helpful so this this is why we've um, we've gone for that um, yeah I, I'm not sure what else to say <laughs> we don't have to speak for five minutes I mean if you want to return to if you've done speaking if you want to return to your seat Okay, thank okay, you. Okay, thank you. Do we have any members' questions? Mike? Thank you, Chair. I was concerned that the, the amount of space available in each flat is, below, is well below the normal standards uh, for space requirements. Um, and I just wonder with the modern living whether it really is practical to um, have one of these um, homes divided up in that way. 
Uh, yeah, thank you for that. Um, yes, you're correct, and it's identified in the report that the internal space standards are slightly below those um, in both the South Yorkshire Residential Design Guide and in the nationally uh, described space standards. However, um, as you may be aware, we haven't adopted those space standards as part of our policy, um, and the property is a subdivision, so it's, it's somewhat constrained already by what can be done with it. Um, and when I had a quick look at the nationally described space standards, the, the size of the property as a two-bed dwelling is actually also below the, the requirements of those space standards um, as it stands as existing. Chair, if I may, I, I do take issue with the, the word slightly below. Um, this, um, I think it's something of the order of 25% uh, reduction in space against normal space standards. I really do have concerns about this um, application on, sp on space grounds. Right. Chair, are you going to come back on that? Yeah, um, sorry, my word use of slightly perhaps was a bit incorrect. So the application uh, as proposed is 29 square metres for each property. The South Yorkshire Res Residential Design Guide says that um, for a, a studio, the space standard should be 33 square metres and the national standards are 39 square metres. Um, but as explained, they aren't adopted. Um, and looking at the plans, you can see that um, the, all the rooms have got a source of light and outlook. Um, and on balance, it's considered to provide an adequate level of amenity. Tony? Um, some years ago, we, we uh, adapted some council properties to a similar scheme. Um, does this property conform to similar space standards to the council ones that we did ourselves? I'm afraid I'm not familiar with those properties that you've mentioned. Um, I accept I'm a lot older than you. Um, but I think, I think uh, from, I was going to ask a question anyway, but your answer is a councillor chaplain it does conform to what we want it to conform to. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Um, can, can, can I ask about um, the, the facilities for parking? I mean, there, there is one space on the property. Um, is it going to create problems on the road um, if, if, if there's other cars parked? You know, is, is there a parking problem in the area? So, yes, there is just one parking space proposed. Um, we did ask for an extra space to be provided in the course of the application, but the applicant declined to do so, I believe. Um, on balance, the property as it stands as a two-bed house is likely to have two cars, um, and it's not considered that the change to two bed sits or studios is likely to increase that any further. Um, so there is one space. There may it may end up with there being one car parked on the street, but there is um, on-street parking available. Um, and so it's not cons considered to be unacceptable from a highways perspective. Thank you. Roger. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's a two-bedroom house, as you just pointed out. Now, that is really quite suitable for a start-up family. How well endowed are we in that area for that kind of property? This was built... At a probably in the 1930s, as a council house um, for a, a small family. So what is the um, situation in the rest of the area, and would this set a precedent for other houses to do the same? I don't have figures on exactly how many two-bed properties are available or, or what the, the demand is for those, but I think the housing stock in there is, is fairly standard and it's probably a mixture of two bed and three bed properties and arguably this would add to the mix in the area by creating a bit of diversity. Um, in terms of setting a precedent um, going forwards, each application will be determined on its own merits and so we would look at those um, as and if and when they came forward. Peter? Yeah, can I comment it really quickly? Sir? I go back a long way, I know this very, very well. And uh, many years ago, we had, the council themselves had adapted many, many two and three bedroom houses. We didn't call them um, 
self-contained studios and Betsy's, we call them flats. The idea was to make, empty some of the, the, the family houses, but allow people to stay on the estate. So they were converted to up and down flats in order to free up the, the, the family houses that were surrounding them. So the, 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 the big problem, of course, there were only the elderly people who lived on their own and nobody wanted to live upstairs. So you had young ones upstairs and it, it, it didn't combine very well because you got a noisy young, younger and then the old person was downstairs. However, this is very different and I think it's ideal really to help people who perhaps live on the estate and can't get, don't want to live in a family house anyway, but would like to live near their parents, etc. And it just gives the opportunity to broaden the offer that, that, that Shire Green can offer families and, and, and people living alone and young people for the first first accommodation. So I, I fully support the recommendation, Chair. They are a bit on the small side, but they, they've worked very well. I mean, it must be 40 years ago when we did this. Um, uh, when we did it, because there was a, too many people living in two and three bedroom houses on their own. And the idea was to broaden that, that offer for, for the the people of the area. So I support the recommendation, Chair. Tony? Yeah, I'd, I'd support it as well. And I think the configuration of a studio type dwelling gives, gives a feeling of more space. And I completely agree with Councillor Price that many people on the estate, single people, want to live on that area because that's where they've been brought up. And I think it does add to the mix of the estate and I fully support it. Diane? Thank you, Chair. Yes, given the tilted balance and the fact that this, these, this, both properties will have shared access to out, outside amenity space, it's, the, the space standards might be small, but there is access to outside amenity space. Um, so that adds something to, to the mix. And as, as, as Peter's already said, it's an area where people want to live and gives a, a, brings a better option to that. So, um, on balance, I will be supporting the officer recommendation. Thank you. Right. Um, I understand this from what I hear, that uh, the uh, national space standards are 39 square metres, the regional space standard guidelines are 33, and this is 29, which is below what I would hope that Sheffield would be going for. And I think we have national and regional guidelines for a reason, and, and it does fall short of them. For reasons of amenity, uh, I'm not convinced that, that these are adequate, these dimensions, and I'll be abstaining on this application. Right, I think we'll go to the vote. So, Brian, we'll start with you. As previously mentioned, I will be abstaining on this application. Thank you. Mike? I will also abstain. Nigat? Um, I'm uh, with this. Terry? I'm for the application, Chair. Peter? For the recommendation, Chair. Diane? For the recommendation, Chair. Roger? Barbara? For the recommendation, Chair. Cliff? For the recommendation, Chair. Anne? For the recommendation, Chair. Thank you, that's passed. Thank you very much. We now move to item 9C, application number 2201032. FUL Abbey Glen, 10 Conley Drive, page 73 of the agenda. Please, thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this is the first of two applications for Abbey Glen. If I can just draw um, your attention to the supplementary report, um, just a few corrections. So the first relates to uh, reference on page 83, where reference was made to the proposed hours for bank holidays being um, 8 a.m. until 4 p.m. The correct hours are actually 10 a.m. until 4 p.m. Um, and similarly, the amended condition, um, condition three, which, which relates to the um, proposed hours um, on public holidays, that has been amended um, to between 10 a.m. and uh, 4 p.m. Um, 
Okay, so uh, moving on. So the application is a Section 73 application uh, to vary Condition 3 of the original planning approval, which relates to delivery hours. The application has been submitted by Abby Glenn, who are um, an industrial laundry who supply rental linen to the hospitality industry and have occupied this uh, premises since early 2021. Uh, this slide shows the red line boundary. Um, the, the site is located um, on a small industrial estate to the south of Althorpe Greenway. Um, this shows uh, the context again, and you can see there that um, it's, it forms part of the industrial estate, um, and that's to the, to the east of the site, but the surrounding area to the north, south, and west is predominantly residential. The nearest properties are located to the west on Waterthorpe Mews. Uh, these are just some images of the site. So that's taken from Carley Drive, and that's a view looking towards the main site entrance. Again, another view taken from Carley Drive uh, further to the south, which shows some of the parking area uh, to, the, to the front of the site. Um, and another view from Carly Drive further towards the north, which again just shows the, the building um, and some of the, the context of the, the parking on the side there. This plan illustrates the site layout as it was approved in the 2003 Planning Commission. Um, the proposal is for an extension to the delivery hours, so the condition currently restricts delivery hours to between 8 a.m. and 4 p.m. Monday to Friday, 8 a.m. and 1 p.m. on Saturdays, with no deliveries on Sundays and bank holidays. The proposed delivery hours are 8 a.m. until 6 p.m. Monday to Friday, which is an additional two hours um, in the afternoon time. Um, the hours on Saturday are to retain, remain the same, and it's proposed to allow deliveries between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m on bank holidays, excluding Christmas Day, Boxing Day, and uh, New Year's Day. The main issue to be considered is that of immunity. Um, there is an outstanding enforcement case on the application site, which has arisen as a result of neighbour concerns relating predominantly to noise associated with the uh, operation of the premises. And that noise relates to plant noise, um, machinery noise, deliveries, movement, and movement of trolleys. Um, there's also been um, an investigation by Environmental Health who have concluded that the property um, is not a statutory noise nuisance. Uh, the enforcement, planning enforcement um, inquiry is, is ongoing. In relation to the extended hours, uh, the increased deliveries will create additional noise through additional vehicle movements, noise associated with unloading and movement of trolleys um, within the site. However, it is considered the extended times are modest and within the sort of remit of normal daytime operating hours. Um, Abbey Glen have requested the hours to enable them to meet their contractual ob obligations um, and to ensure continued viability of the uh, business. Um, on balance, it's considered that the modest increase in hours is acceptable and won't result in um, an unacceptable impact on the amenities of the nearest residential properties. So the application is recommended for approval. Thank you, Sarah. Right, we have quite a few speakers on this. Um, each speaker will be allowed five minutes, and it will be a strict five minutes because of the number of people we have. So... Um, the first speaker is Sean Corey, please. Thank you, Chair. I would like to give an overview, if that's okay. Before I start, everything that we say is our lived experience. Carly Drive is a designated business area as per Sheffield's UDP. By definition, B1 is acceptable, B2 is unacceptable. This is as per IB7 of the UDP. Going forward, it's hard to see how any potential future application for B2 can be acceptable. 
The original restrictions put in place in 2003 were, and I quote, in the interests of the amenities of the occupiers of the adjoining properties. Nothing has changed in residential terms. It, and it is seen, it is thought, that the worst amenity to lose is that offered by the resident's back garden. Abbey Glen has residential properties on three sides of it. By far, the vast majority of residents have back gardens facing Abbey Glen. Most don't overlook Abbey Glen's entrance and can't see that, their activities. However, we hear the unloading, we hear the trolleys, we hear the shouting, we hear everything at all hours. Therefore, we have lost the worst amenity to lose. On top of this, they run 18 and a half hours per day for much of the year, giving us just five and a half noise-free hours per day, Monday to Friday. We sleep with windows shut, even in 40 degree heat. Some residents have sold up, some have moved bedrooms. Even a council officer has admitted that some homes will become uninhabitable. We will be the first to say that residents just a couple of streets away possibly don't hear Abbey Glen. We have nothing at all against Abbey Glen or their employees. We believe they're just in the wrong place. Those who have objected have not had a, an easy time of it, besides the lack of sleep. We have been accused of many things. Intimidating residents into signing the petition. Some of the signatories are here today. Our petition was concentrated on the streets we knew to be affected. Yet they got their employees to write to planning. Some of these employees lived half a mile away and, and much, much further. Our arguments are met with scorn and seen as petty. But why would we stir up trouble? We lived peacefully side by side with the previous occupiers' school trends for the 14 or so years that they were there. Personally, I get on well with the directors of Abbey Glen. We communicate regularly and I have a positive, positive attitude with them, positive relationship with them. <clears throat> but we found that Abbey Glen are very good at playing the victim when all their problems are of their own making. They say that they like to be treated like all the other companies on Carly Drive, and yet not one of the other companies have 14 lorries and four vans, and not one of the, the, those companies have 300 trolleys that they want to store outside. No, nor do the other companies choke the entrance to Carly Drive with their vehicles. But what upsets me, though, is when we are accused of lying, despite filmed evidence, as one of the things which I will mention in the next application. Anyone who has anything to say against Abbey Glen is a liar. They're very good at telling half-truths, like not being a nuisance in terms of the tonal noise. For the record, the EPS couldn't take further action against Abbey Glen because Abbey Glen achieved best practical means of noise reduction, meaning they had a defence in law because they did their best. That does not mean that they are noise-free as they claim. But what incense residents was the use of a noise survey company to assess the tonal noise because this sound survey company had a pre-existing relationship with Abbey Glen and was therefore flawed because it wasn't independent in our view. How can a sound survey be trusted when there's a pre-existing relationship? The delivery survey that they carried out was flawed too, arguably designed, and I say arguably designed, to give Abbey, Abbey Glen the, the result they wanted. It is our assertion that the site is too small for their needs. They constantly disturb our everyday lives, well-being and amenity. They breach IB7, IB9 and GE24 relating to noise and open storage, etc. As the documents say, and I quote, development in business areas should not cause residents in any housing to suffer from unacceptable living conditions, nor should it make access difficult or unsafe or create problems of parking on roads and streets, end quote. Their pursuit of profit before people is shocking. These neighbours from hell, as one of our councillors has called them, want us to completely change our way of life to make up for the mistakes that they sure, have made. I'm going to have to stop you there. You've had cool. five minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Dawn, please. No, thank you, Chair. When Abbey Glen purchased the property, they did not research the area, as in the very first sound survey, they did not mention Waterfield Mules and Sandy Acres, 
Plus, this was done when Abigail were not operational. They also did not apply for planning permission for change of use and machinery. They didn't take into account on how they would affect residents' lives. We agreed to the 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. on deliveries, but collections should be incorporated into this due to the noise of the movement of trolleys being the same. The SDD technical note, Abbey Glen say, lorries do not depart until 8 a.m. This is not correct, as a lot of their lorries go out between 6.30 a.m. and 8 a to 8 a.m. Abbey Glen do not abide by rules implemented now, always breaching, breaking rules. They have been caught on several occasions unloading lorries after 4 p.m. and also on bank holidays where no deliveries are allowed. Deliveries is an act of unloading, not returning with a lorry. When delivering, the lorries are not allowed to idle the engines, a sign on the wall states. But they said they have to keep the engine running to earn the tail lift. Deliveries and collections with no trolley movement after 6pm weekdays would not affect our amenity. People, would be able to go, people who go to work early hours would be able to go to bed early. At present, we have lost our amenity due to the noise of the trolleys being moved around up to 9.45 p.m. and sometimes later. You can hear the staff shouting and the slamming of doors. Videos and pictures we can provide. Bank holidays are given by the government so we can have a rest from work. We lived in a quiet area. Abbey Glen are only 30 foot away from our houses. Again, they breach rules with deliveries. Take, a, for example, Queen's Funeral. Doctors, dentists, supermarkets, some hospital was closed, not Abbey Glen. Deliveries collections work from 7.30 in the morning till 10 p.m. at night. So I guess clean towels are an emergency. If they do work bank holidays, then they should be restricted hours. 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. deliveries and collections to be incorporated into these hours. They should not be allowed to work Easter as we do need a break from this noise. Abbey Glen have no respect for anyone. Always blame other companies for noise, even when the other companies are closed. They say they have spaces for 41 cars and 14 lorries, but what about the three or four vans they have? Up to date, Google Maps shows outside buildings that take up car spaces, four spaces for electric cars. If they can accommodate all the vehicles, then why do their staff park on the road every day? A lorry and a van was parked on the road uh, on a weekend, the gates were closed and locked, Abbey Glen weren't working. The lorries were locked on vehicles and were both unattended. I understand that their vehicles, if parked on the road, are not insured. People who work for Abbey Glen have supported the application, but live between half a mile to ten miles away, so they are not going to be affected. Abbey Glen have put tarpaulin up to stop us witnessing breaches, not for the noise. They also park a lorry, so to block our view. We have got videos to prove this. Breaches to have hefty fines. Bully boy company who think they can do what they want when they want. They have no respect for residents' health and well-being, because if they did, they would never have moved here. Carly Drive is a business estate. Holbrook is an industrial estate. Abbey Glen are in the wrong place and need to move. I'd just like to thank the residents that could come today but I know more wanted to, to, to come, but have work commitments. Just one last thing. Please ask yourselves, would you want to live day in, day, like this, day in, day out? And just to let you know again, if videos or pictures are required, we can do that. Thank you. Thank you, Dale. Um, next speaker is Mike Pete, please. Thanks, Chair. Good afternoon, members of the Planning Committee. You might wonder why I've got this in my hand. <laughs> it's the Mosborough Master Plan, given to me by Councillor Joe Ashton, who uh, was a councillor in this place. Um, when we moved to where we are now, which is just actually on the first slide, you can actually see where we live. We're one of the nearest neighbours, I regret to have to say. And we, there was nothing, there was no Waterthorpe estate, there was nothing on Carley Drive. And uh, when our solicitor, we were discussing the purchase of the house, uh, he said, I can't find anything out about Carley Drive. 
because it's right next to you, we could see it. There wasn't a landscape mound as there is now. In 1975, there was nothing there. He said, I can't find anything out, but I think there's a plan. I happened to work where Joe Ashton worked, and Joe said, oh, I can show you what it's about. It's this, actually. <laughs> Unfortunately, although it's got everything in it, it doesn't say anything about the specifics. But it did say uh, development, opportunities for development. When I saw Bill Mickey, who was the chair of this committee a long time ago, Bill said, we're going to, yes, Carly Drive is for development opportunity. If they're successful, the, development, the developers on Carly Drive will move on to industri industrial estate because there was nothing there then. We saw, in fact, I was one of the people involved in building a youth club. It was the first unit, first development on Carly Drive, the John Mar Barnett Youth Centre. Now it's the a Boxing Academy, but we were the only thing on there, and we had a youth club, a very successful youth club there, and uh, it thrived. But like a lot of things, the kids found it, um, a bit too restrictive and so they preferred some of them prefer, prefer, preferred to play on street corners etc causing some aggravation to the community this is uh, the agenda item 9c and you could see by all the tabs on the side i was going to go through it but uh, i don't think you need this from me now you've heard we are local residents we're a bit brassed off with the noise that's coming out of the site now Formerly, when school trends were there, there were good neighbours. When we went litter picking with certain other councillors around here, we could put the rubbish in their, uh, in their disposal things on, uh, on that site. But uh, Abbey Glen are very friendly, but actually make our lives quite miserable, actually. And so I would say, um, sadly, uh, they shouldn't be there anymore. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Um, our next speaker is uh, Sean Frost, please. Good afternoon. My name's Sean Frost. I'm here today to lodge my objections to Abbey Glen submitted planning applications for extended delivery hours outside storage and increased numbers and movements of cages, together with the parking of lorries and staff cars in and around the Abbey Glen side. First point I'd like to raise is the issue of cages. I've worked with a large quantity of these cages for the last 16 years. Health and safety guidance at work recommends we use ear defenders when moving them. This is due to the very high level of noise whilst cages are moved around. The level of noise is equally high whether they are empty or full when the cages are banged together while moving and storing. Targets are set by management to maximise production, therefore employees, by nature, will feel obliged to rush to meet these targets. It stands to reason that these cages will be wheeled around at speed and will bang together, which will obviously create more noise. This will happen despite Abbey Glen's management plan uh, to ask their employees to place cages carefully so that noise is restricted. This is an unrealistic proposal for employees to work to targets and tight schedules. This leads to my objection to the application of 300 plus cages, which I understand are to be for outside storage. Abbey Glen claimed that outside storage won't impact on amenity of the local area. That clearly isn't factual and should be challenged because I have vast personal experience of working with these cages and the noise they create. Extra cages mean extra lorries and extra distribution and deliveries, which in turn will increase the noise levels. As close neighbours of Abbey Glen, we are extremely concerned about the application for outside storage and movement cages to be increased to between 7am and 9pm as originally put in. As it is, Abbey Glen are breaching their own agreements on a regular basis as it has been evidenced that trolleys are being moved between 10pm and 11pm 
which is out of agreed hours. We strongly object to any increase in delivery and operating hours to the previously agreed hours for the Class B1 business unit which was occupied by school trends. With regards to parking, there is a complaint on council run Fix My Street about ongoing bad parking on Carley Drive. Uh, photographic evidence if, uh, which I wish to submit to the committee. This shows staff vehicles parked on pavements which should be parked on site, not on Carley Drive. This indicates there is insufficient space in Abbey Glen site for parking of vehicles. This affects the visual amenity and safety of the locality. With the application for hundreds more cages together with the application for outside storage, this will push parking of staff vehicles out into the surrounding residential area. This will obviously cause consternation with local residents. It, is, it has already been observed that the drivers have to reverse lorries into Abbey Glen to load and unload and to park up at the end of the day. This is clearly dangerous due to the tight space in which they need to manoeuvre. We can see where one driver has obviously misjudged the space and driven into the perimeter fence. The damage to the fence has been seen. I would also like to point out that if Abbey Glen are currently working 18 hours a day, five days a week with the existing flow of stock and cages, then it stands to reason the application is inc for increased numbers of cages and extended delivery hours will mean increased operating hours. This could quite possibly result in operating hours of up to 24 hours a day. I would like to finish by reminding everyone that all these applications submitted would not be relevant to a Class B1 business that is because these applications have been submitted by a B2 business who are trying to manipulate the council into changing the rules of who can operate on Carley Drive B1 business area. Thank you. Thank you, Shane. Our next speaker is Councillor Tony Downing. Please, Tony. Thank you, Chair. Uh, and with your indulgence and the indulgence of the committee, I'd like to put the two together, uh, uh, you know, the two applications. They, they run concurrent. Yeah. Can I just come in? Some of the speakers have already done that. I'm sorry, I forgot to explain that at the beginning. Some of the speakers have spoke on both applications for Abbey Glen. Okay. Can I carry on now? Okay. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, I wish to speak to the two planning applications uh, for Abbey Glen. The first with regard to outside storage and the second with regard to extended delivery hours. Since, since Abbey Glen moved to their current site in 2020, I have worked with Clive Betts MP to address a number of concerns that local residents have raised, primarily about noise coming from the laundry site. My comments today are made on behalf of both myself and of Clive Betts. During the last two years, we have met with local residents. We have been to visit them at their home and we have also been to visit Abbey Glen and talk to their management and also to some of the workers as well. We have tried to work with all parties including planning officers to find solutions to what clearly have been real and difficult problems. Before Abbey Glen came to the, school, came to the site, school trends occupied the site and there were never any problem that residents raised. Residents have not raised any other concerns about local businesses either. In, uh, the view of myself and Clive Betts is that the real difficulty here is that Abbey Glen moved to a site without undertaking full evaluation of the restraints that would be imposed on their business. They moved into the site without having full regard to the constraints on deliveries and the effect that the operational workings and their plans could have on local residents. We are concerned to ensure that local residents can enjoy their homes in a peaceful and quiet environment, but we are also concerned, conscious that Abbey Glen are now on the site employing a significant number of workers, and we do not want to see the people lose their jobs, particularly at this difficult uh, economic time. Our approach, therefore, has been to see if compromise can be reached, which everyone would be happy with. Therefore, in regard to the extended opening hours, we would be inclined to support this on the basis that the extension is not considerable. 
It fits in with the deliveries of other businesses in the area, and I think there have been some general agreement from residents that if th th that is the only change, they will be willing to accept it. There would be, still be some reservations, but we feel that the compromise is a reasonable one. This does not, of course, in any way ignore the fact that there are still residents' concerns about noise from the laundry itself, which are, as explained, subject to further investigation and reports that will be made by planning officers. The more contentious item is outside storage. It was clear from the very beginning when Abbey Glen moved into the site that they had no permission to store anything outside. We have been told by Abbey Glen that the storage of cages is not really outside storage, but unfortunately it is. The cages are significant in size. They are large in number, uh, numbers, uh, uh, in number, and they are extremely noisy when they move around. It is simple, a simple breach of the condition on the site when Abbey Glen moved in, and we do not see any reason why they should be, be allowed to, a significant variation from the previous condition. This is something that Abbey Glen themselves should have taken account of when they first moved onto the site. Finally, the alternative is for Abbey Glen to use inside storage. They clearly need more cages to operate their business than they can accommodate inside the laundry at present. And we think the challenge ought to be then to find another way of dealing with the cages that does, that does not impact on local residents. It is the noise aspect that these cages that we are most concerned about and therefore support the planning officer's recommendation that the outside storage of cages should not be allowed. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Tony. Right, our next speaker is our speaker's four, and I've got Ben West first, please. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you all today. <clears throat> We'd also like to thank Sarah Hull for the recommendation to grant changes applied for in regards to the delivery hours. We are wanting to vary this condition to enable us to meet our customer needs and ensure the survival of our business, which has been going for over 100 years. We are responsible for the employment of over 150 people and want to be able to guarantee their jobs and stop staff from needlessly losing hours during the cost of living crisis. In summary, the condition in its present form is highly restrictive to our operations and causes us to lose customers during 2021. A change to this condition, with the times proposed provisionally agreed with planning in April, 26 weeks ago, will enable the business to remain viable. The change to 6pm will enable us to meet contractual obligations. It will allow for stock to be processed to go back out the next day. It will enable us to unload vehicles when factors out of our control, for example traffic issues, prevent drivers getting back before 4pm. It will allow us to unload in a systematic fashion directly into the factory in the main, resulting in reduced cage movement in the yard. The ability to load and unload on bank holidays are crucial for our business. They and the days around them are the busiest days in the hospitality calendar. We have let multiple customers down over the last 18 months due to restrictions on bank holidays. At no point has noise from loading and unloading been highlighted as an issue from the City Council through the evaluation of independent noise surveys led by and verified by the EPS. Delivery management processes mean that noise is limited. The change would allow us to meet our contractual obligations, continuing to provide and create more employment opportunities for people who live locally, which ultimately should benefit the local community as a whole. The proposed change will allow for a smoother unloading process in the main straight into our factory as vehicles will unload one at a time, which will minimise impact further. The EPS have already concluded the noises coming from our site are not a statutory noise nuisance, and at no stage have lorry and van movements been brought up by the EPS by the two independent noise surveys being an issue. The world has moved on massively since the conditions were originally put, put in place in 2003. Traffic on the road has increased by 36% since the late 90s, journeys take longer than before. The advancement in the haulage and delivery industry, along with the influx of delivery companies like Amazon, DPD, and Every, 
means that deliveries take place throughout the day. We've had to send delivery drivers away who've been on the road for seven or eight hours as they've arrived 10 minutes after four o'clock. The working day is much longer than it previously was and an extension to 6 p.m. fits with modern life. Businesses on the same estate as ourselves have deliveries much earlier and later than we have requested, with wagons beeping, forklifts moving stock and equipment around late into the evening. The Business Sheffield website states that Sheffield has, strong, has a strong business community with a genuine appreciation of local independence and knowing the value of how local businesses help our communities and ensure people have jobs. This describes our business. We're doing our utmost to ensure people have jobs. The proposed changes we feel are reasonable and sensible and they would bring us in line with the world as it is now. It will allow us to provide staff with a full wage as we'll be able to retain our customer base making sure hours are not cut. And crucially, the business will remain viable, ensuring over 150 jobs remain and the families of these staff are not affected. Thank you for your time, and I hope you approve our request. Thank you, Ben. Can you turn the... Okay. Um, our next speaker is David Knight, please. Hello. Firstly, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak with you all today. I appreciate you've heard from and will hear from a range of people, all with differing views on the applications before you. For my part, whilst I'm an employee of Abbey Glen, I've been asked by my fellow co-workers to put forward their concerns and the impact the process is having on them. I do this independently of the directors of the company and speak on behalf of those, quite frankly, who are intimidated by this process and simply fear for their livelihoods. Many of these employees are local residents of Waterthorpe and the surrounding areas. The vast majority are residents of Sheffield. Our workforce is made up of people from all over the world who fled their homes and come to the UK and ultimately to Sheffield. Our city promotes itself quite rightly and proudly as a city of sanctuary. As a business, this is something we embody that is clearly evident in our workforce. Some of our staff have horrific stories to tell, but working for us, many of their first jobs, when no one else would accept them or take them on, has given them a sense of worth, improved well-being, and they take great pride in being able to give back. We're an extremely diverse team. We have workers who have suffered from addiction issues, a major issue in the area we operate. Mental health issues where jobs they've secured with us are the first ones in several years, crucially allowing them to earn their own money, develop independence and rely on the state less. At a time when those who have always been comfortable with their earnings are struggling, the pressures of paying our mortgages or rent, our heating and our weekly shopping have never been greater. This is not a short-term issue and myself and my colleagues are desperate for some level of certainty. Not knowing if we'll be able to get our full allocation of hours next week creates further stress. This is exacerbated by knowing that the work is there to be done, but the company is inhibited by these overly restrictive conditions. Whilst we're aware of the concerns of the residents have raised, some of which actually have nothing to do with Abbey Glen, it seems they're being blamed for anything that happens in the area. We don't wish to be a nuisance and we believe we can be and are a major asset to the local area. We have seen the effort made by the company to mitigate any confirmed issues. As employees, we have done and will continue to do what we can to support these measures. Quite simply, we have to. For many of us, a satisfactory outcome from all this is imperative to us in order to make it through the cost of living crisis. That said, it's not as simple as a wage packet at the end of the month. I've already touched on the diversity of our workforce, but Abbey Glen has gone further than many employers would. The support that is offered from the company goes beyond that of many. Of course, they have assisted with issues such as the right to remain for our foreign employees. However, they've gone further time and time again. Assistance with setting up homes ranging from references to the supplying of white goods, the arranging of medical appointments, assisting those members of staff who can't read and write, things that many take for granted but cannot be achieved without somebody willing to support them. Quite frankly, the employees of Abbey Glen want to live and work within the community and be a benefit to all. In response, some have been met with abuse, racist language, and fear for their safety. A small but vocal group not only make them feel unwanted while simply trying to pay their way, but also makes them feel unwelcome in the local community. This flies in the face of everything Sheffield claims to be. 
We need support from those in power to allow us to earn a living and provide for our families. I'm proud to have been educated and lived in Sheffield. My colleagues and I are proud to work for Abbey Glen, a company long associated with Sheffield that has given many of us opportunities other companies couldn't. Everybody is struggling currently. Every hour matters. For every hour here or there that the company is forced to sacrifice, this has a direct impact on hundreds of local people. Starting an hour later, having to finish an hour earlier, before you know it, at the end of the month and you're missing an entire week's wage. This isn't spare money or bonus or bonus missing from their pay packets. This is money needed now for electricity and food. Even if it was spare, it's likely a lot of it would be spent in the local community, improving the situation for everybody. From an employee point of view, the requests made by Abbey Glen seem wholly reasonable. They're not asking for 24-7 working and they've been confirmed to not be a statutory noise nuisance. There is a commitment to working with the community to offer others opportunities and work together for the betterment of the area. I ask on behalf of the many employees and their families that you approve the requests made and allow Abbey Glen to be the valued employer Waterthorpe and Sheffield needs. Thank you, David. Do you want to come back on anything further, please? Just uh, to clarify a couple of points. Um, in terms of uh, the points raised, uh, some of them, in relation to noise, there was reference to tonal noise um, and hours of operation of the premises. I just want to draw attention back to the fact that we're just focusing here on the additional impact of those extra delivery hours, so the additional two hours, Monday to Friday, and the additional bank holiday working. Um, the other matters aren't for consideration as part of this application. Um, in terms of enforcement, and there's reference to whether it's a B1, which is now use class E actually, um, or a B2 use, that is something which is being considered as part of our enforcement inquiry. Um, and it shouldn't, this, this application, um, Although it's, although it's being considered, this application will not prejudice the findings of that enforcement inquiry. Um, yeah, I think that's all I need to say. Thank you, Sarah. Um, members, questions? I have Barbara first, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, two things. First of all, can you clarify what delivery is? Because we had the comment that um, delivery isn't just sort of the, um, the truck rolling up. It's also the actual time to unload it as well. So when does a what is defined as a delivery? That's the first thing. I'll let you ask that first. I'll come back to my second one. Thank you. So the condition that we've got that's historically applied to the application relates to delivery hours only. Um, and in terms of, sorry, was the question... So what constitutes delivery? Because we had a comment from uh, one of the speakers that delivery isn't just the van rolling up, the delivery, the unloading can go on way beyond the set hours. So that's a wanted clarification on it. Is, is the, does the delivery finish when the van is unloaded and moves away or when the van draws up? Well, that's a good question. Um, and I think I would need to seek further clarification on that. And that's something that we could, we could seek further clarification on. Um, but that would be an issue regardless of whether we're extending the delivery hours by the two hours that's proposed now, or whether we're sticking with what we've got, um, that would still potentially be the case in terms of clarifying exactly what the delivery is, whether it includes the unloading, whether it's just the arrival of the vehicles. Except that, of course, that could extend the times, as the, the residents pointed out. So that needs clarifying. I'm a bit ambivalent about that. The second thing is, I mean, sort of, I'm assuming that we can discuss both aspects of it because they have been discussed. And we were observed the traffic movements yesterday, sort of that van unloading, and the time it took and the inefficient way it was doing it. I'm not surprised that sort of vehicles have to wait on the road with backup. Now, I mean, sort of, I think I mentioned yesterday, sort of, isn't there, has any discussion taken place about a better look at the site for traffic movements? For instance, sort of, um, I think if you go back to your slide, whoops, hang on, I've lost it now. Um, yeah, you've got the you've got some of the lorries parked up next to the road. I think it was the third slide in. It looks like a power. Yeah, that one. I mean, you know, the applicants said that they want um, parking spaces for their vehicles, and yet we observed completely open space. 
uh, at the other end of the north end of the park, whereas these vehicles from the picture there and from our visit yesterday, there must be a permanent fixture on that place. Why can't that be used as a turning circle so you've got one way in, offloading at the site, and then using that to sort of create a new entrance back onto the road so that that would cut down the side site noise considerably. So I think it's a comment, but the resident um, uh, uh, councillor Downs, Downing said that they were willing to work with the applicant to decrease the noise. So, I mean, it's not something that we can actually include, but sort of have other discussions taking place about ways of minimising the problems with the traffic, like altering the layout of that site. Thank you. Um, I'm cautious about answering this because we've not presented this, the next application yet, um, but I will answer it anyway, briefly. Um, we've judged the application on the basis of the, the plans that have been submitted. Um, we would be willing to consider other alternatives, um, but we're looking at what we've been presented with at, at present. Okay, thank you. I'll have to accept that. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I might be looking a little bit at semantics here, but it, it, it follows on about um, um, the word deliveries. Do, does that mean to and from the site, or is it only goods inward? I believe it's only deliveries to, not collections from. Okay, thank you. Um, so there, 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 there's no proposed um, restriction on, on 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 loading a vehicle and and it departing at any time of the day or night. No, there there aren't, um, and that wasn't on the original application. Okay, thank you. Mike. Thank you, Chair. Um, if I can bring a little bit of. Uh, personal experience to this kind of work when you're outside loading and unloading four-wheeled containers. When four-wheeled containers are left outside in wet weather, inevitably you get an element of rusting of moving parts and that will generate louder squeaking noises than if they were kept indoors for the duration. And I do wonder why there isn't more storage area that's enclosed, because that would protect those containers. And I, I can well understand the residents who live nearby um, resenting and objecting to, to those noises. That kind of squeaking is by its nature unpleasant. It may not reach the decibel level, but it's... Um, <coughs> When you're away from work, it's not a noise you want to hear. It's a bit like fingernails going down a mirror or a pane of glass. Um, and the place where I worked was in an industrial area, so it was well away from housing. Uh, <clears throat> the other thing I w wanted to come on to was um, on page... 81, we, sorry, no, on, sorry, in the amendment, it, it does, which relates to page 84, it does relate to deliveries and nothing is said about collections unless that's somewhere else in the report and I've overlooked it. Um, and clearly the residents are objecting to the collections going on at hours outside those set aside for deliveries. Uh, and it does seem strange that that issue has not been addressed. Um, when we walked round the site yesterday, um, those, those of us that were there, we did notice some fencing up in places, but it was by no means comprehensive. So while that fencing may have blocked out some of the noise, clearly noise was getting out from the, the site through the gaps um, and I'm not entirely convinced that that kind of wooden fencing uh, was effective in limiting the, the level of noise. And lastly, although no one's touched on it today, it, did, it did get, does get a mention on page 81 about um, soap and water 
not emitting obnoxious odours. Well, there's a surprise. But if you heat it, if you heat the water, and you have chemicals coming off of dirty clothes, then you can get obnoxious smells and fumes. And what I did see yesterday were the open vents and the steam particles escaping from the building. It wasn't particularly obnoxious that morning, but I can well understand that depending on what, what condition um, items of clothing, sheets, bedding and so forth come in, that you could have days when the smell is quite, for want of a better word, rank. Thank you, Chair. Members' comments, which I think we've just gone through myself. Right. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to remind members that this application is for extending the delivery hours for two hours. Um, and I think uh, a lot of comments have been made that aren't material to that decision. Uh, so I just wanted to remind members of, of, of really what the application is for and what the decision that you've been asked to take. Thank you. Uh, can I just clarify the question about deliveries? Um, so, mine is very kindly. Um, uh, so, the delivery refers to the process of completing the requirement. Um, you haven't delivered the goods if they remain in the lorry. Um, but for clarity, we could include unloading within the condition. So we could put um, deliveries to include unloading, just to confirm that that unloading process should occur within those timeframes as well. Brian? Um, I just wanted to clarify, perhaps from the, the highways officer, um, in connection with this first application of two, it says, uh, as part of the proposal, that provision of car parking accommodation is part of this, so it's not simply about delivery hours. Is that correct, uh, officer or highways officer? So this application just relates to, to condition three. It's just seeking to vary the delivery hours. It doesn't include the changes, any changes to the parking provision. That's dealt with in the next application. That, that's fine, but it is mentioned within the proposal, so that was where some confusion could come in. Okay, that's because um, when you're describing an application, you have to repeat the description of the original proposal, so that's the 2002 application. The description's been repeated on there. Yeah, that's fine. That, that confirms what I, what I want to say will be within the next one. Thanks, Sir. Nia? Hi, um, just a question, um, just with my mental health background, um, with the noise and listening to residents, I think sometimes, you know, we, d we don't realise the level of impact uh, this can have on um, your mental health, and especially uh, for me, it's quite concerning, uh, the, you know, with children, um, bedtime, the, the disruption there as well, and the impact... Um, people's mental health and loss of jobs and homes where people are, if I'm right, uh, in understanding, uh, people are thinking of uh, moving due to the level of noise and stuff. So um, I'm just going deeper into uh, the residents and the gardens is something that we all know uh, from the pandemic, the importance of our gardens. And if due to the noise, we're not even able to actually enjoy those gardens when we need them, uh, the level of impact it has. Um, so it's just something concerning. I mean, both sides, I, I, I'm hearing both sides and I I feel for uh, the level of the emp employees that shared, you know, um, their concerns. But is there any way where this ro noise reduction, even though it's two hours um, extension, but if the residents are already facing uh, the impact due to that noise and having extra two hours, um, you know, I, it's very concerning to me. But um, also just picking up, um, there has been some sort of breach in the current planning conditions and I don't know whether that has been looked into. And 
because that would give uh, the residents the reassurance. So if you did extend to the two hours, if things aren't being um, followed properly currently, according to this, um, the report that I've got in front of me, how can we or you reassure the residents that the two hours won't do further injustice? Okay, so in relation to your first point, um, again, we're just considering the extra impact of the two hours here, of, of the, the noise from the delivery. So that relates to the, the vehicles moving, unloading, um, and movement of trolleys. Uh, there is obviously a, a wider issue in relation to noise from the plant and machinery um, and the general operation of the site, which is con being considered as part of an, an enforcement inquiry, inquiry separately. So really what we, we're looking at here is that extra impact of the two hours and they are up until 6 p.m. which in terms of I think you mentioned sort of children's bedtimes um, I think that's probably before most children go to bed um, and in terms of uh, a breach of hours um, we haven't um, served an enforcement notice in relation to any breaches to date because uh, of the these, this application which was under consideration um, so when this application is determined, um, however it's determined, we would then look towards whether we would need to serve any enforcement notices and going forward we would monitor that um, and, and serve any relevant notice. Peter? Do you want questions, yeah? Okay. Well, do you, do you want to clarify, Chair? We, we have two, two plan applications here. Can I get it? The first one is... The concern is the outside storage and the noise of moving them at 7 a.m. in the morning. And the second one is just the delivery at 8 a.m. in the morning, which we're, we find that's not so bad. It's the other way around, Peter. We're discussing okay. increasing hours at the moment, which is... Um, no, I'm busy. To allow storage, storage, outside storage hours of between 7 a.m. and 9 p.m. We don't like that. But the second one is the delivery hours between eight a.m. Eight, eight on sorry between yes about eight hundred hours and thirty on Saturdays and that one's okay. Vanessa, Vanessa wants to come in on this. Sorry, Chair. Um, I just thought it might be just be useful to mention, and perhaps you missed it, that the agenda items were changed at the beginning of the meeting. So this is the application. Um, relating to the extended delivery Sorry, Chair, hours, I forgot about and that. the second one is the storage uh, issue. Thank you. Which I did read out at the beginning of the meeting, Peter. Do we have any further questions, comments, Barbara? No. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Sorry, Chair. Uh, I just wanted to uh, remind members that as part of the discussion, the planning officer did suggest a potential amendment to the condition could be made. Uh, and if that is something that members wish to take up, we'd need to have that proposed, seconded, and, and then voted on. Thank you. Thank you. Barbara? Yeah, the, sorry. The proposal was sort of to make it clear what the delivery hours meant, wasn't it? Yeah. Diane. Thank you, Chair. I've got a comment. I, 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 um, right, I, I think I'm sensitised. I know we're talking about the two-hour extension to delivery, and I think the meeting would suggest unloading as part of that process. Um, I know that's what we're considering here, but I think I'm as sensitised um, to the reduction in amenity values by businesses operating on um, extended hours or inappropriate sites, probably as much as the residents are. I'm aware, that because of casework that I've done in the past, I'm aware that the threshold for statutory nuisance is very high. Um, and I think there is a need to consider, we are, yes, we are considering just a two hour extension, but that has a cumulative effect in, in my view. And if it, it, there will be no respite 
from the noise of delivery and unloading on bank holidays um, or Sundays with, oh no, Sundays aren't included in this. So we get 55 days a year where they get peaceful enjoyment for the rear garden and their own homes. And all the rest, they, all, all the rest of the days of the year, the 310, um, they get an extra two hours of noise nuisance to, to make up for. I, I can't, I know this business is doing its best to operate um, under difficult economic conditions on its current site, but I can't help sympathizing with the residents because they're trying to have a decent standard of living and peaceful enjoyment of their own homes for 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Um, and I'm afraid I, I can't support this application. Thank you. Peter? I still can't get this. Uh, th these are the same hours that the other firms are are delivering at down the road, is that right? No, it's just the hours that this app, this site is delivering at and proposed to be delivering at. Suggesting eight till one on Saturdays. Is that right? And eight till six on Monday to Fridays. And Sundays, 10 till, till four. I mean, it doesn't sound excessive to me, that's what I'm saying, on deliveries in most firms I know. Yeah, or no deliveries on Sundays. You mentioned deliveries on Sundays, but there aren't any proposed on Sundays. Excessive compared to the normal deliveries that we get every month here on plan applications. Right. Yeah, that's the opposite view that it, it, it isn't excessive. Chair, sorry. Um, members might be, find it useful to note that the amended wording of the condition is on the supplementary, which I think um, make, clarifies actually that the request um, has um, a little bit better than what's in the report. Thank you. Any further comments from Brian? Um, like Diane, I'm a bit apprehensive about this, but it seems to me that the location and the hours connected to it have become an issue. And so actually on the grounds of the amenity of the local residents, I will not going to be supporting these extended hours. Any further comments? Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I, I find this hugely difficult. Um, I, I think from the point of view of the residents, there's probably a lot of little things adding up to a big thing. You know, perhaps it's the smells and it's the noise. And um, I know we're not talking about the smell and that, and, but, 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 but lorry movements and possibly cage movements. Um, I, I find this hugely difficult. I, haven't, I, I can't decide, but it's, um, I, I don't think I can support it. Peter? Yeah, it is a difficult one, Chair. And, uh, and it's trying to balance the fact that this is zoned for light industry and it's close. However, I agree with, with, with the clerk that the, the compromise I suggested here is reasonable. The delivery day or times are no different to what we accept right across the city. If somebody who lives in the East End, this is compared to, it's, it's not a problem. I, I think this bit of the, the bid is acceptable to me, and I'm going to support the officer recommendation, Chair. Any further comments? Yeah, I'll, I'll make the comment that sort of, you know, with that clarification of what sort of um, the delivery hours are, 
and I think there's a lot of scope for actually improving the situation if only the sort of the owners get together with residents to look at sort of ways of reducing sort of noise levels. I think it is, I think I'd approve it, but I do think it's a, it's a difficult case. But, um, yeah. No further comments? Uh, just clarification. Are we going to accept the definition of, uh, of loading that was suggested by uh, the officer? <laughs> if we change the... Sorry, sorry, Chair, we just need clarification on whether you want us to, uh, whether you, someone wants to propose formally uh, varying the wording of the condition and that needs to be seconded. If, if can. Barbara. Yeah, sorry, I'm happy to propose it, obviously, because I think that will sort of um, help considerably. So, so if we change it to something along the lines of... Yeah, I believe the officer earlier suggested, um, which, which is to include deliveries. Uh, uh, sorry, we should include uh, unloading. Yeah. So, so if we look at condition three on the supplementary, it could be changed to deliveries to the proposed business, which by definition shall include the unlo unloading of goods, uh, which uh, shall only take place during the following times. Is that what you're proposing, Barbara? Uh, yes, I think so, because, I mean, that gives clarification, doesn't it? It was a delivery that was mentioned, though, that this is the thing. You know, the collections doesn't actually sort of feature in the planning application, does it? Um, I mean, the, it, it's just really the, the conversation and, and the comment that's picked up. I support Barbara's proposal, but if we're not if we're not talking about deliveries and unloading, and we're also talking about loading and um, collection, we're talking about a whole different ball game, aren't we? Um, and th that's not covered in this condition at all. And I think we need to specify this because it, all we 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 are under the impression as members, or at least um, with the amended condition that Barbara's proposed, that we're looking at deliveries to the business and unloading of those cages that are a result of the business. And I can see Barbara's nodding, and um, I, I think we need some clarification of, around this. Is it just deliveries and unloading we're talking about, or is it loading and collection of goods as well? I, I, I'm, I'm getting more and more confused the more we discuss this. You're not on your own. <laughs> Chair. <laughs> uh, Chair. Um, can I just take this opportunity to um, advise members that this is a, a Section 73 application. Uh, so this is an application to amend the condition of an existing planning uh, permission. And all we can consider here is, is that amendment. Uh, the conversation that's already been uh, ongoing regarding unloading, uh, I think uh, the, the advice set is that unloading and deliveries are, from, from the office perspective, seem to be the same thing. And that amendment is just a clarification of something we already considered to be the case, but it's just provided there for clarity that delivery is to include unloading because it is uh, objectively seen as, as one process, um, if you like. If you're going to, if members are minded to sort of broaden out and look at other issues, I think that is going beyond the remit of a Section 73 application, which is just to consider this condition which is being asked to be amended. Thank you, Vanessa. I think that clarifies exactly what we've got to vote on. We're voting on, do we allow under condition three the extended hours or do we not? Well, we've got to take a vote on the amendment of the hours. Um, yeah, so can I have a, a, a proposal? We've got that, so I just need a show of hands then, please. That's to amend the hours as... To add, to add unloading. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and add unloading. 
Sorry, Chair, can I just clarify um, what I believe has been um, asked of members at the moment is a show of hands whether to amend the condition um, in that's, and then the vote would be taken separately as a second vote on the actual application. Um, so uh, currently it's, it's a show of hands as to whether to amend the condition as proposed to include a reference to, to clarify that it's to include unloading. Bill, can we have a show of hands, please? Yep, that's through, thank you. And now we'll go to the vote on the extended hours, please. So, um, Brian. Um, I will not be voting for the extended hours. Mike? Against the extended hours. Like that? Sorry, I won't uh, be in favour of the extended hours. Against the extended hours. Peter? For the extended hours, dear. No. Against, Chair. Roger? Uh, for, Chair. Uh, Barbara? For, Chair. Cliff? Abstain, Chair. Anne? Against the extended hours, Chair. Sorry, Nigga, I didn't quite catch yours. Can you say it again? I'm not uh, for it. You're against it. You're against it. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yes, thank you. I'll make that six against, one abstention, and three for. Chair, um, it, it would appear then on, on that basis. Um, that the vote on the officer's recommendation has been lost. Um, therefore, the next part of the process would be for a member of the committee to uh, move uh, reasons for refusal um, uh, and then have a discussion on that. So, are you voting for refusals? Please give me a why you refuse it. Please vote. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I think it's the amenity value. Um, the, the reduction in the immunity of the extended hours, the impact of that, the cumulative impact of that on, on the residents in the area. Mike? Yes, Chair, I agree with Diane. I, <coughs> I do think that the... Uh, it's, it's the nature of the noise that is, is the problem from those wheeled cages um, to the external environment, which is primarily um, domestic. Um, and, and there are ways to mitigate that, either by enclosing the storage area for those containers um, or by um, putting up <coughs> fence fencing or walls that um, mitigate noise. I need to go in there, Mike. We're discussing the hours, not not the movement of trolleys. It's the, it's the failure to address that. I think otherwise it would be, um, you, you, could ex you could reasonably extend the hours in the knowledge that the, the noise levels would not be adversely affecting the neighbourhood. Um, can I just draw attention to, um, it's a, the next item to be discussed, but on page 59 there's two reasons for refusal for the next application. The second reason relates to um, immunity issues. Something like that would seem potentially appropriate for, for this application. Yeah, I, I, if I can just come in there, Sarah. Yes, thank you. I, that, that, does, that does seem to hit the mark. I think we just need to include the word cumulative in there because it's a cumulative effect of the... Yeah, uh, of the so that's what you're proposing, is it, Anne? Yep. Yes, please, Can I have someone to second that, please? Sorry, the Repeat the proposal, please, sir. Do you want me to read out the refusal? Yeah, okay, so it says, the local, local planning authority considers that the proposal will result in, and as per Diane's suggestion, we could, could add cumulative yeah. impact 
somewhere in there, we'll put it in, um, it will relate, it will cause unacceptable noise and disturbance to neighbouring properties, resulting in a harmful impact to living conditions. The proposal is contrary to unitary development plan policies IB9 and GE24 and paragraphs 130 and 185 of the National Planning Policy Framework. I'll second that, Chair. Mark, can we take a vote on that, please? Brian? Right, I have to say, um, on my saying for the recommendation, yes, I... <laughs> For the, confused, for, for the recommendation, Chair. For the recommendation, Chair. For the recommendation. Tony. Peter. Dan. For the recommendation, Chair. Roger. For the recommendation, Chair. Barbara. I have to be, I have to abstain, I think. Cliff. For, for the recommendation, Chair. Anne. For the recommendation, Chair. That recommendation has passed, thank you. The next application is uh, the second um, application for Abbey Glen. Um, so I'll leave that down to Sarah to present, please. Thank you. So this is the second application for Abbey Glen. Uh, this is a section 73 application to vary condition 13 of the original planning approval. Condition 13 restricts outside storage and Abbey Glen would like to remove this condition to allow external storage to the south of the building to comprise 300 crates and uh, a skip. Next slide please, thank you. So just to recap, the red line boundaries as per the previous application uh, the site's on an industrial estate and surrounded by residential properties. Uh, and that's the aerial image, again, showing the, the context which we discussed previously. Uh, so these are some of the images taken from the site. Uh, so this is taken from the corner of the building, and that shows some of the external storage that's already occurring on site. Those are these crates which store the linen, um, they're on wheels so they can be moved around and they're stored at the present to the side of the building. This is another image of the crates um, and shows a relationship with the um, entrance into the building. This is taken from the public highway from Carly Drive. The image does show some external storage at the front of the site there but that has been removed um, during a recent site visit it was clear that that had been removed. Um, and so the only external storage relates to that, to the south of the building, as previously shown in the images. This image shows the site entrance. Um, you can see some of the lorries stored on site there and some, um, some on-street parking as well. Um, and this image shows uh, another view taken from Carly Drive, uh, showing the building and uh, some parking there as well. This slide shows the approved site layout. Um, and if you just look to the left-hand side of that image, you can see a large circle. That area was the approved servicing area, and the, the circle is the turning area for vehicles that would be servicing and delivering the unit. Um, and then there's vehicle parking surrounding the building uh, to, the, to the east and to the south. If we move to the next slide, we can see the proposed layout. So. Um, the application proposes up to 300 crates in the area to the south of the building, as you can see there. Um, the crates were as shown on one of the photographs, but is also illustrated in the left-hand corner um, of the picture there. The applicant has stated that they, would, they require the external storage um, so that they can rotate stock into and out of the building. I believe that there's limited capacity within the building to store sufficient stock. Um, and so external storage is required so that Abbey Glen can meet their contractual um, 
obligations of, of processing linen. The key issues to consider relate to highways and immunity. As, as you can see from that image, uh, the storage is now within the area which was previously approved for storage and for turning. Um, as a consequence of that external storage, um, the applicant has submitted this new layout plan which shows how the site, the parking will be arranged within the site. Um, you can see that there's an area that's got, I think it's got eight lorries in. Um, that was previously all parking and then there's some lorries stored to the, to the north of the site as well. Um, Though the storage of the lorries there has meant a reduction in parking spaces, the parking has reduced from 85 spaces to 45 spaces. Uh, that level of parking is less than required by our parking guidelines. Um, in addition to that, the lorry parking as shown there is very, very tight. Um, the vehicles are almost touching in that image and it's considered that in reality, that arrangement of parking is likely to be really highly impractical um, and that in itself will result in lorries ending up potentially parked elsewhere within the site which will further uh, reduce the amount of parking spaces um, and that will push parking onto the local highway network. Um, if we go to the next slide. Um, some tracking information has been submitted with the application which shows how vehicles will enter and exit the site. Um, the tracking data shows that the movements are very tight um, and there's concern that because of the tight nature of those movements, there will be some conflict between the movement of, of the lorries and the cars parked in the spaces. Um, in addition, the lorry storage area to the north of the building would require vehicles pulling into the site and then reversing along uh, a large, for a large distance. That's the image in the right hand of the screen. So it shows the vehicles pulling in, turning to the left, and then reversing back. Um, and it's considered that that length of reversing maneuver would be unsafe. Um, so in relation to highways, it's considered that there will be a, a harmful impact in terms of um, an increase in uh, parking on the local highway network and also um, potential conflict between um, vehicle maneuvers and harmful impacts on pedestrian highway safety in that respect. Um, in addition to the highways issues, um, it, there are amenity issues as well. So the storage is proposed to be um, permanent, but the crates are proposed to only be moved between the hours of 7 a.m. and 9 p.m. Um, as we've discussed before, um, that, that is in close proximity to residential properties and concern is raised that the movement of those trolleys and crates in such close proximity to residential properties will result in a harmful impact to immunity and living conditions of local residents. Um, as a result of the highways concerns and the immunity concerns, a recommendation is made for refuse with enforcement action. Thank you, Sarah. Two speakers on this now. I'm assuming that, Mike, we're not, we're not, we're not there yet. Can I request, request a, a five minute adjournment, please? So we've been going nearly two hours. Yeah, yeah, go on then. Well, five, five minutes, back at turn just before five, Jim. Right, we now go to speakers. Um, now, I'm going to ask people in turn because some of you I do know spoke on both of these and I will ask you if your, your first submission also includes this. So I'll go through the list. I think you want to speak again, don't you, Tony? No, I can't. Yep, right, so let me go through the list. Let me go through the list. We'll do it this way. Sean Corey. You do need to speak again. Yep, that's fine. Dawn. No. Mike? Yes. You wish to speak again? Sean Frost? No, I think that's it. And Tony, you say no. Yeah, right, so we'll go to Sean first then. Sean. Yeah, please, five minutes. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. 
Okay, thank you. I'm opposed to this application. Abbey Glen have given a fictional account regarding residents' opinions about outside storage. It has been said that I personally was happy with outside storage, that I said trolley movement between 7am and 9pm was acceptable. I didn't. It's pure fiction. Residents in the affected area have not said cage movements between 7 and 9 is okay. Besides, Abbey Glen don't even abide by these hours anyway. It goes on all hours. We hear them, as I've said, at all hours. The refusal to allow outside storage is sound. It's based on sound advice and facts. However, I believe Abbey Glen could have misled the planning department. They seem to have supplied conflicting information. The sustainable development and delivery document that Abbey Glen rely so heavily on to help their case, and that document forms the basis for this refusal, states that they have 109 employees and yet the application on the planning portal states that they have 150 employees. You yourselves have heard them say that this afternoon, 150 employees. But that's not all. In a corporate film freely available on YouTube, their MD states that they have between 145 and 200 employees. So which is it? 109, 150 or 200? Because even if it's 109, it's still far too many, many people as proven comprehensively by the planning department. Abbey Glen tried to blag their way with neat or no, not so neat maths and truths and half-truths, at the same time showing no consideration for residents who have been there for decades. I still can't work out why a noisy factory would move into a residential area and then try to make the residents adjust their way of life to suit the factory. Why did they not carry out due diligence and research the area? What a massive error of judgment. I want to add one other thing, that the described soap is not what we think of as soap. It's things like caustic soda from memory. We have residents who have complained about an increase in asthma attacks since the arrival of Abbey Glen. And according to the gov.uk website, the chemicals used by Abbey Glen can trigger asthma attacks. Residents have complained of an odour since they arrived. We smell the smell only when they operate. These chemicals are in 1,000 litre containers. We have photographs of these containers next to a large gas cylinder outside, near a fence. These 1,000 litre containers are just a few metres away from our homes. Finally, the parking is less than shown on the diagram earlier by Sarah Hull. There are objects in those parking spaces now. In essence, those plans are not up to date. The parking area is less than you think it is. Thank you. Mike, would you like to say this, please? Thanks. Thanks, Chair. Um, can I refer members to uh, page 64, the bottom of 64, the last uh, part of it? Um, outside storage is the thing that I want to speak about. And one of the slides that was shown showed the proposed outside storage. And that, thank you. Oh, that slide. The outside storage there is pretty extensive. And I live very near to it. And uh, prior to some fencing being put up, I could see it quite clearly. And um, uh, in the past, Abbey Glen have had fires, or a fire in particular. And there have been, during this long hot summer, there have been other fires. Uh, I am particularly concerned that amongst those crates, which will be of dirty washing, uh, there could easily be some spontaneous combust combustion. Now, the fire service say it's perfectly safe, etc. But something has set... There have been fires at Abbey Glen, it's a fact. What the cause of... The, I'm not a fire officer, I don't know what the cause was. But the, that storage, right next to what is a tree, a landscape mound covered in trees now, mature trees, 40-year-old trees, lots of leaves. This summer there have been fires. There was a fire at Kiverton Park where properties, new properties caught fire. The trees on that, uh, just over the boundary there, will might catch fire. If, there's, if there are flames or if there's some malicious uh, event there and uh, our garden actually abuts those trees. I'm fearful that my three apple trees will 
transfer the fire emanating from Abbey Glen into our properties. I live on, there are about three properties that back onto um, Abbey Glen and I'm fearful that there is a, a fire hazard that the fire department say, oh no, won't happen. But, uh, you know, unfortunately, life experience has changed us for some things for us. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. The next speaker I have, or didn't speak before, is Pauline Thorpe. There we go. Thank you, Chair. Um, my presentation is, the site on Carley Drive is far too small for Abbey Glen's business, and that is the main cause of all, problem, all the problems. We hear, and comments in letters sending, sent, sent to residents that misinformation is given by the media, derogatory comments, negative comments from councillors, and knocking on residents' doors, intimidating elderly residents, is not going to alter that. We have the sound of the trolleys, which I can only describe as being like having a dustbin collection hour after hour after hour, day after day after day. It is simply not acceptable. Residents are also worried, because of the fire at Worksop, about the safety of their own homes. Abigail state they have sprinklers, fine. The trees surrounding the property and our homes do not have sprinklers and therefore are more at danger. Uh, we might, I might add that there, uh, a freedom of information request has been submitted to Nottingham, Nottinghamshire Fire Service to find out more details about that fire and how it may impact on us. The re this is a residential change. When I bought my home, a Carly Drive, and many of my fellow residents, Carly Drive was a field. It is now, yes, a business site that we haven't had problems with until Abbey Glen moved in. But the, the commercial site at the opposite side of the road has been finally that there's loads of room there for more businesses to locate there. And that was the only long-term solution for Abbey Glen because their site on Collier Drive will never be suitable for their purpose. Thank you. Thank you, Pauline. Um, the next speaker who is for um, the application is David Horsfield, please. Chairman, a change to the current restrictive condition will allow Abbey Glen to use space on site like others on our industrial estate and every other industrial estate or business premises. Items away from the main road and are not visible to local residents. These are items that are not required and we can't fit in a factory on a daily basis. Namely, bins or skips, deliveries of stock. So, which Kevin Oxley has reviewed the technical data, data and confirms there's no danger from that. Soil stock in cages, as per all hospitality and hospital laundries, as well as most hotels. Secured excess empty cages until required. The majority of have got rubber wheels. We need to change the changing condition to maintain on-site health and safety, meet insurance conditions, utilise the abundance of available space effectively on site, have an external bin like every other business we are aware of, manage stock into the building in a systematic fashion, be a viable business. Every industrial hospitality and hospital laundry, as well as most businesses on industrial states, will have to store items outside. We are in a similar position where we don't have the internal space to store everything we need. If we can't store the mentioned items, in particular, soil linen outside, then we are no longer a viable business. 
even if we could find appropriate space to store lorries and linear storage externally, we, we'd lose 20% of our, our working hours. Staff will lose anything from 13 to 25% of their weekly wage. However, with breakdowns and issues with traffic, we would expect the actual loss of working hours in a week at times to be near 50%. This isn't the basis for the business to continue or for people to earn a decent wage. We are desperate to improve the business and our benefit to the local area. We are and have always been available for any resident, councillor, MB, MP wanting to meet on site to have a constructive discussion about the issues raised. We've always wanted to, and continue to want dialogue, even willing to take calls on holidays or coming at weekends, the late hours for meetings. We will discuss anything and will listen to any reasonable suggestion. In answer to the concerns raised on external storage, we would clarify the following. The items we store outside do not impact on any other business or local resident. On a voluntary basis, we don't move cages before 7 a.m. or after 9 p.m. The items stored outside, as confirmed by the fire brigade and our independent fire risk assessment, are not a fire risk. For the first time ever, we've got a sprinkler system on our building. Items stored outside are not creating noise issues, as confirmed by a lengthy and detailed environmental protection service investigation and two independent noise surveys. From, firm, from a firm we had no prior arrangement with. <laughs> the professionals didn't tell us to do anything on cages and cage movement. Planning applications were only submitted in line with council advice after we were no longer a noise nuisance and it was confirmed that we were never an obnoxious smell issue. This was after we finalised finalized all necessary property improvements that the EPS told us to carry on. We worked as quickly as the EPS allowed in respect to works required doing additional works above and beyond. Vehicles can access and manoeuvre on site with items stored in an organised manner, as per the experts' technical notes submitted. We haven't had any issues with deliveries, internal or external, in 18 months of operating, with space on our current site larger, larger than previous sites. This is despite us having an additional two large vehicles on site from a contractor for the last six months. If you speak to our drivers, they will assure you our site is either easier to drive around than the hotel car parks and the narrow streets they visit daily. There were more vehicles parked on the road in front of our site before we were operational and the drug deals no longer take place in front of our building. There is a very small minority, unfortunately, against our business. The feedback we have from our employees who live next door and by others from the community is very positive. Some of the feedback has been given during walks around with the councillors and local MP. The large majority of the community and businesses in the area support us being here and support our diverse employees. We have faith that you will support what seems to be a very reasonable and sensible amendment. Thank you for your time and please approve this amendment. Thank you, David. Do you wish to come back on anything, uh, Sarah? Uh, the only thing I'd like to clarify is that in relation to fire, safe, fire issues and fire safety, um, the applicant has submitted an email from South Yorkshire Fire, um, fire Safety Officer um, which states that um, an assessment has been undertaken and it didn't raise any concerns about the outside storage. Um, and that's as much as we would require, um, we wouldn't, and that, um, from a planning point of view. Thank you, Sarah. Do we have any members' question? Anne? Can, can I just clarify with officers, when this area was designated in an industrial site, which was uh, referred to by the, the last speaker? Thank you, Chair. Sorry, was the question, when was it, in, was it designated? Yeah, is um, it, and when was it designated an yeah, industrial it's a, site? Yeah, it's a, it's a business area, um, and that was designated when the Unitary Development Plan was adopted in 1998. So it's not an industrial site, it's a business area. Oh, Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Any further members? Question? No? Any comments? It's just, uh, just again, clarification, maybe it's already answered. Um, just looking at everything, uh, do you know when this business was actually, obviously you have planning permission 
uh, and all of that. So wasn't all this looked into um, during that stage when a planning permission was given? I'm just finding it very difficult that you know with all the the impact uh, this this is having on the local residents and everything. Wasn't all this looked into during that period before you know getting to this stage? It's just a question. So planning permission was granted for this for the building in 2003, um, and there were conditions put on the, that application, which was what these um, Section 73 applications relate to, to protect the residential immunity at that time. So um, this condition, including this condition, which said no external storage should be allowed. Um, Abbey Glen have then occupied only occupied the building since 2000 and. 21, I believe, um, and they are operating at present under the previous permission. Brian? Um, apart from the slides, is there a travel plan that's been provided for this? It would help me to uh, understand more about the, the traffic and the impact on the highways. No, a travel plan hasn't been submitted with the application. Any further comments? Barbara? Yeah, I think it's reiterating the comment I, meant I made before about sort of the use of the site and whether other proposals have been in, uh, looked at because looking at that, again, sort of it doesn't, it seems a, way, a lot of waste of space there and because it actually increases traffic movements and delays, I think that has a knock-on effect on the residents because it makes, there's longer periods of noise um, for any operation to take place. So I, I'm, I, would, I would support the re officer's recommendation that this bit be refused because I think a lot more could be done to ameliorate the noise can, that goes with sort of extra the outside storage space. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Mike? Chair, I'll second that recommendation from Barbara. Thank you. Well, I we may move to the vote. Brian? Yeah, on the basis of resident amenity and the impact potentially on the highways, uh, I would uh, uh, go with the officer's recommendation on this and refuse. Mike? Yes, I agree. I would go with the officer's recommendation. Okay. Uh, uh, with the officer's recommendation. Tony? For the officer's recommendation. Peter? Reluctantly for it, yeah. Diane? For the officer recommendation, Chair. Roger? Uh, for the officer recommendation. Barbara? For the recommendations. Claire? Chair. For the officer recommendation, Chair. Anne? For the officer recommendation, Chair. Thank you, that's passed. Thank you. We now move to item 10, a record of final appeal submissions and decisions. As of page 111 of the agenda, has Gina or Sarah got anything? Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, this is the record of planning appeals and submissions and decisions. Um, most of the, I think all the applications were delegated decisions, and uh, I think you can see that most of, um, most of them were uh, dismissed uh, when they went to appeal. Um, there were a couple of adverts in, in sort of largely commercial areas that were allowed, uh, hoardings, um, and then um, it might be just worth touching on the uh, enforcement appeal, um, uh, which was uh, allowed, which is the final, the final item on, uh, uh, on page 116. Um, so we uh, issued a, a, a Enforcement notice against the unauthorised demolition of a conservatory and erection of a single storey rear extension and provision of a canopy. Um, and uh, and that, was, that was allowed uh, in this case by the inspector who, um, 
who gave weight to the fallback position in this case. So it was a four metre deep extension along the common boundary um, uh, with a neighbour, uh, but he gave weight back to the fallback position uh, of being able to build a three metre deep extension that was four metres high uh, under permitted development rights. Um, and also he gave weight to the orientation of that property, um, uh, the extension, sorry, which was to the north of the neighbours and the, the nearest window that was affected was a, um, in his view, uh, a kitchen, in this case, that was a non-habitable room. Um, uh, and so they allowed that appeal in this, on this occasion. Thank you, Chair. Can members please note that? Thank you. My date and time of next meeting is Tuesday the 8th of November at 2pm. Thank you all for attending.